I want to introduce um, Dr. Javier Ursad. Um, Dr. Ursad is the James Chair Professor of Latin American Studies, and he's a professor of anthropology at Brandeis University. He's both an archaeologist and a bioarchaeologist who studies the development of ancient complex societies in Mesoamerica. His work has been key in understanding the origins and implications of early Mesoamerican writing, especially in ancient Oaxaca. He's the author of the groundbreaking book, Zapotec Hieroglyphic Writing, which deciphers this early script. Uh, the Zapotec tribal, uh, scribal tradition was one of the earliest uh, in Mesoamerica and has one of the longest evolutionary trajectories, making it key to understanding the development of Mesoamerican writing systems. His work on Zapotec writing has transformed understandings of the ancient city of Monte Alban. His bioarchaeological work focuses on the social dimensions of mortuary practices and on cultural and ritual modification of human bones. He's conducted forensic analysis of large burial series from several archaeological sites in the central valleys of Oaxaca. Dr. Ursed has written other books. Um, and, and he's written more than 70 articles and book chapters. So we're delighted to have Dr. Ursed talk to us today. Uh, the title of his talk is Power Co-Constituted, the Role of Early Writing in, in Monte Alban, Oaxaca. So welcome, Dr. Ursed. Thank you uh, so much, Catherine, for such kind uh, introduction. Um, and I would like to thank um, Carol Cleland uh, and the team at the Origins Center for the kind invitation to participate in this fantastic event and for giving me the opportunity to share with all of you uh, some of the ideas that I have been working on uh, for the past uh, three decades. Uh, so let me begin. I'm going to start sharing my screen. And making sure that everybody can, can see my slides. Um, my presentation is actually um, highly visually um, involved. So um, let me begin um, by saying that a, a most intriguing example of carved human bodies set in a Mesoamerican monumental context was reinscribed in the present day social memory of Mexican peoples and the world over by the local reference of the dancers, a term recorded in print as early as 1902. Such a label undoubtedly derived from the reputed iconicity. Since then, however, scholars have debated their representational nature and meaning. Diverse arguments have been mustered to support the view that the human figures are renditions of courtly mourners personages with royal diadems, pregnant women, naked figures, monkeys, marching Aztec warriors, court buffons, emasculated priests, animated figures of a demonic quality, bodies afflicted by disease, omic queens, dancers and swimmers, priests or shamans in ecstatic trance, or slain captives. The latter view eventually became an independent argument supporting two models based on cultural ecology and practice theory. In one, the role of intercommunity competition and warfare is highlighted, while in the other, the emphasis is on the rise of intra-community elite elaboration and monopoly of an ideology of divine human reciprocity based on sacrifice. The reading of the human figures as slain captives also led to view these instantiations of a visual form of communication as serving fundamentally a propagandistic goal of terror directed towards potential enemies or by the elites towards commoners. The stauncher supporter of the slain captive interpretation contends that, in quotes, by now, almost everyone agrees that these figures depict slain captives. If searching for knowledge were to be reduced to a democratization process, the audience may be entitled to ask why should there be another discussion on these carved figures? Printing repeatedly a given interpretation in scholarly forums 
conforms quite well with the paradigm that sees writing as merely propaganda. And of course, Western civilization may still believe that the sun revolves around the earth, if not for the contesting voice of Galileo. Being cognizant that without knowing the code, a picture is not worth a thousand words, my intent here is to pursue a heuristic exploration to see how far I can go with a reassessment of the meaning of these human figures based on different premises. In contrast to previous exegeses, my central assumption emphasizes that the semiosis of the imagery needs to be approached by contextualizing the carvings in their architectural setting. By doing so, the building to which these representations were incorporated can be viewed as part of a culturally constructed landscape that anchored in space collective experiences with the aim of promoting a sense of community identity in a new experiment of urbanized society. Our present understanding of the human-made landscape that shaped social relations and embodied community institutions during the earlier occupation of Montalban is admittedly limited. Sometime during the fifth century BC, as the settlement began acquiring an urban character and the top of a series of hills were transformed by massive construction projects, its builders capitalized on some of the most daring architectural enterprises ever witnessed before in the social history of the central valleys of Oaxaca. Of the few known early loci of monumental architecture at Montalban, the most staggering was a structure built on the southwestern quadrant of what eventually became the main plaza. The building had a long and complex architectural history involving two structures, an earlier inner edifice here on referred to as building L sub and a structure that eventually covered it known as building L. The archaeological investigations of the structure have been mainly confined to the exposure of architectural features in the top level of building L, the clearing of the entire eastern face of both L sub and L, the excavation of four tunnels into both structures, and of one deep vertical probing that reached bedrock. These explorations suggest that the superimposed buildings underwent at least five major architectural modifications. The earliest construction phase, hardly touched but ar by archeological explorations, evinces traces of a large rectangular platform with its long axis running north-south. Its actual size is, is unknown, but it could have been at least 170 by 66 feet. The platform had sl slightly sloping walls rising 18 feet in height. Towards its nor northern end on the east side, the architects built a staircase to gain access from the ground level to the top of the platform. The asymmetric location of the staircase divided the eastern face of building L sub into two facades, a shorter one to the north and a longer one to the south. The latter was built using a technique of setting megaliths some of them weighing several tons each, against a core of unworked small stones and earth. The blocks were then with, the blocks were left with irregular contours, and except for the frontal face, none of the surfaces were dressed. The only carefully prepared surfaces depict human figures carved in countersunk relief. Two sets of monoliths were made. In one set, the vertical dimension exceeds width and in the other, the opposite relation applies. These were laid out in six alternating rows. The staircase indicates that the platform supported superstructures, but nothing is known about them. Based on the ceramic materials found within the construction field, dating of this first phase of construction is most likely sometime between 500 and 300 BC. During a second phase of construction, the platform of building L sub was enlarged to the north. This addition is clearly distinct from the original platform because it, its builders use small rectangular stones laid in rows instead of megaliths. The second modification to building L um, uh, sub may date sometime between 300 and 200 BC. 
The third major modification to the structure entailed the addition of a broad and shallow staircase abutting from the eastern phase and symmetrically placed in front of the previous staircase. This modification to the building may date to sometime in the first century BC. Building L underwent a fourth phase of construction. This construction episode radically transformed the shape of the structure since it entailed building a two-tiered platform with sloping walls that covered only the northern half of building L sub. Consequently, the southern half of the earlier structure was almost completely demolished. The builders also raised the foundational level of building L, um, and I'm referring to this portion here. To do so, they filled in a strip along the southern extension of the east facade of building L sub, covering some of the carved blocks that formed the basal row of the wall. The material used to raise the level of the ground along that strip was largely made up by many of the carved stones dismantled from the facade. Others were taken away to be used as construction material in coeval or subsequent architectural projects that took place elsewhere elsewhere in the main plaza of Monte Alban. The two-tier platform of building L supported a triad of structures, including an elite residence, I'm talking about this area here, and two small room enclosures. Based on the ceramic assemblage recovered from one of the tombs associated to the residence, dating of the fourth building episode is securely placed between 350 and 500 AD. There was still a fifth phase of construction that saw the rising of the second tier of building L and the construction of another triad of structures similar to the previous one. Based on architectural details, the dating of this last major construction episode must be towards the 6th or the 7th centuries AD. Although building L did not undergo subsequent substantial modifications, Several architectural details indicate that the triad of structures on top of the platform were altered and occupied until about the mid 9th century AD, when the political collapse and slow abandonment of Monte Alban began. The investigations that led to the discovery of the carved stones associated with the first version of building El Sub go back probably to the latter part of the 18th century when someone dug a short tunnel running south-north through the crumbling debris near the southeastern corner of building L. The fact that the intrusion ran along the basal portion of the decorated facade of building L sub suggests that surf surface erosion had previously exposed some of the carvings and that their partial view actually motivated the excavation. In 1806, Guillermo Dupé, a Franco-Spanish explorer who wrote the earliest known account of Monte Alban, cleared the intrusion to better view the carvings, fully exposing six contiguous megaliths from the basal row. The drawing that accompanied Dupé's account rendered the carved stones devoid of their architectural context, and the drawn contours of the megaliths make them look as nicely dressed rectangular blocks. About 100 years later, in 1895, William Holmes visited Montalban and drew the upper portion of two of the stones. From this drawing, it is evident that the intrusion cleared by Dupé had filled in again with much deposition. From the turn of the 20th century, we have an early photograph of the exposed carved stones. The depicted persons include the hacendado who owned Montalban, Providing, providing a poignant scale of the megaliths. A few years after this photograph was taken, namely in 1902, Leopoldo Batres, who was the general inspector of archeological monuments during the regime of Porfirio Diaz, conducted a major exploration in building L. Among other things, Batres dug a trench exposing a larger portion of the buried facade of building L sub, revealing four superimposed rows of megaliths. The trench soon encountered the southern cheek wall of the basal staircase that was added to building L sub 
during the third phase of construction. The presence of only four rows in this section of the facade, instead of the six that were derived from the architectural analysis, is most likely due to the fact that the exposed portion is precisely the limit between the section of the platform that was left intact by the superposition of building L and the portion of L sub that was completely demolished. As shown in the slide, the architectural analysis predicts that additional carved megaliths are still encased within building L. The drawing published by Batres of the carved megaliths that still remain in primary context discloses a patterned position of the figures. Given the size and the arrangements of the megaliths, the first and third rows depict vertically carved personages, while the second and fourth rows show human figures in prone position. Furthermore, the figures carved on the megaliths in the first, second, and fourth rows face to the north, while those in the third row face to the south. Lastly, the southeastern corner of the facade um, that was investigated by Batres included two monoliths carved with vertical linear inscriptions. Since many of the carved blocks originally set into the facade of the dismantled portion of building L sub have been uncovered in many different parts of Monte Alban, the first task is to proceed with a hypothetical architectural reconstruction following the patterns evinced by the carved blocks found in primary context. Once illustrations of all the available evidence were uniformed as to scale, the human figures were visually reconstructed following the most common features and attributes evident in those carvings that are still in good state of preservation. So for instance, uh, there are cases of loose and fractured monoliths whose fragments can relatively easily be conjoined or for instance, embedded fragments that can be reoriented and hypothetically reconstructed, or even instances of loose fragments that can be used to recreate scaled full monoliths and count minimum number of carved stones. Such a procedure yielded particularly in the case of highly fragmented stones, a hint as to the size and shape of the original stones a critical benchmark to fit the reconstructed drawings according to the mentioned patterns. It should be stressed that the reconstruction shown here cannot claim veracity for the specific placement of individual blocks. It merely follows the leads provided by size and shape of the blocks, as well as the overall posture and facing directions of the carved figures. Several observations can be made from this reconstruction including the fact that 137 carved blocks conform to the established patterns and that the nearly two-thirds of the wall can be filled in. As to the carved figures, and despite the obvious variability, their features are quite consistent. The representations are always contained within the irregular shape of the megaliths. While the head was rendered in profile, the torso is shown frontally or in three-fourths view. The body exhibits a short, almost non-existent neck, and the idealized physiognomy is chubby. The face is characterized by a broad nose and thick lips. A facial expression is conveyed by an open mouth that reveals two teeth and at times by closed eyes. The lower face um, does not have a projecting uh, chin. Seemingly naked, the figures wear a tight cap as headgear. Sometimes, the presence of openings in the caps can be surmised from locks of hair, either loose or braided, short or long, protruding from different parts. Personal ornaments invariably include ear flares, and few of the figures exhibit beaded colors and what may be rattling anklets. A couple of bodies bear marks that may signal painting or tattooing. Only two of the attested figures show the male genitalia, while in the rest of the examples, the groin area displaced varied patterns of scrolls. 
at least 21 representations are accompanied by short hieroglyphic captions variously placed in front, behind, or over the torso. It should be stressed that because most of the megaliths underwent several taphonomic processes, including weathering while in their original context, fragmentation due to the demolishing, dragging when uh, reused in other buildings, and further erosion once exposed by archaeological explorations, the presence or absence of certain features in many of the stones, like the closed eyes or scrolls over the groined area, personal ornamentation, and glyphic captions are impossible to assess. None of the carvings show a ground line, and there is wide variation in body postures. The most common one, clearly evident in the blocks on the third row, and I'm referring to this particular example here on the right side of the projection, is a seemingly standing position with the legs slightly separated and bent at the knee joints. The hands may hang loose on either side of the torso or in front of it. It, at times, with one extremity flexed at the elbow joint in 45 or 90 degrees. The vertically placed figures on the first and fifth rows exhibit more variability in body, body postures, positions that appear to render squatting, jumping, or walking actions. In several instances, a sense of body motion is farther enhanced by the placing of an extremity over the head or by the crossing of the arms in front of the torso. The body postures of the prone figures, now I'm referring to the uh, ones illustrated at the top, on the second, fourth, and sixth, uh, sixth row exhibit as well much internal variation with forward, downward, or upward facing directions, arms and legs stretched, arms and legs bent and placed below the torso, as if the figures were shown crawling, or by rotating 90 degrees clockwise, the model of the vertically placed body posture. Another important observation that can be derived from the reconstruction is the overall pattern displayed by the rows. While the prone representations on the second, fourth, and sixth rows have their heads invariably oriented north, the facing direction of the vertically placed human figures in the first and fifth rows evidently follows a Baustrophedon sequence. Considering the architectural context, this meandering progression appears to mimic the action of the vertically placed figures as if they were climbing the staircase of the basal platform to reach the summit. The distinction between figures in prone and vertical positions must have been significant, and this is a point that I will address later on. A clarification regarding the hypothetical placement of the inscribed blocks placed as upper cornerstones is required, as only two of the stones in the basal row were found in primary context. In other words, what Batres uh, found were these two blocks at the bottom. Okay, those are the only ones that were found in primary context. Two of the other stones shown here were encountered loose, battered, and fragmented in front of the facade in the strip that was filled in order to raise the foundational level of building L. The uppermost stone, this one here, was found placed as a floor slab in the architectural complex adjacent on the south side to building L sub. Aside from the fact that the out-of-context inscribed blocks were found in the near vicinity of the southeast uh, corner of building L sub, the justification for their specific placement in the reconstruction is based on several independent epigraphic arguments that happen to strengthen the Baustrophedon sequence noted in the vertically placed human figures. Despite the fact that the signs in the inscribed text, texts consistently face to the south. The text that is carved on the three basal monoliths displays a format that was used throughout the historical development of the Zapotec script. Such a format begins with a glyph that signals an annual date. It's the sign that is shown in turquoise blue and olive uh, green. 
and ends with a glyph uh, with an iconicity of a tied bag, which is this one here in gray color. Thus, the reading order in this case is from top to bottom and from left to right. The cornerstone in the third row with two columns of glyphs has the signs of the tied bag at the end of the left column, this one here. In order for the text to adhere to the syntactical pattern of the basal one, the position of the tied bag sign implies the existence of a steel and accounted megaliths, megalith that was carved with a, an inscription that began at the top with an annual date. So this is the hypothetical uh, missing stone that would have had the initial text. Thus, the, as expected by the Baustrophedon sequence, this text was read from top to bottom and from right to left. Now, the uppermost corner has also two columnar inscriptions, but the annual date appears at the bottom of the left column, this one here. Therefore, one can surmise as well the existence of another as of yet unaccounted monolith inscribed with a single column whose uppermost sign was the tied bag. So this is the hypothetical missing block to complete the text. The Baustrophedon pattern is again evinced by the reading order of the last text, since it proceeds from bottom to top and from left to right. Now, shifting the position of the annual marker to the bottom of the inscription was most likely to facilitate, facilitate its viewing as this text was placed high in the wall. Since certain features of the ancient calendar are now well understood, it is feasible to determine the minimum uh, span that is generated by the two available annual dates. So proceeding from the top, uh, from the lowermost to the topmost, um, there is a span of 48 years. This span is significant because it suggests that the events recounted in the three texts encompassed no more than three human generations. The recorded inscriptions may uh, refer to at least three rulers, the vanquishing by one of them of the rulers of an enemy lord, the enthronement of uh, the rulers, which is signaled by a glyph of a seated lower half body. Let me show you where that sign is. There's one here and there's another one here. and um, seemingly a genealogical statement. Now, aside from the annual dates, the actions seem to be situated as well in terms of specific days within a lunar count. Now, the possible name of one of the rulers appears as well in one of the stones from the third row. The inscription on the latter stone also includes the seated lower half body sign, whose semantic value is likely that of enthronement. The stones used in the partial reconstruction of the portion of the southern facade of building L sub hardly exhaust the available corpus of carved stones of the same general type and style. But the remaining examples could not have been part of the facade because of the size and shape of the blocks, new patterns in the facing directions of the figures, and or because the representations display other attributes that are not present in those already placed in the facade. Now, following the features just listed, it is feasible to group the remaining evidence into four additional sets. One of these groups has human figures with practically the same attributes as those on the megaliths from the facade, not only in terms of overall physiognomy, but also in regard to the types and range of variability in postures. They also appear wearing a tight cap on their heads. Scrolls in the groin area are present as well, and at least six individuals bear short hieroglyphic captions. While both vertical and horizontal blocks are available, the size of the vertical stones is smaller than those from the facade. Furthermore, the facing direction of the figures in both vertical and horizontal monoliths implies their arrangement towards a central focal point, perhaps a small staircase leading to a superstructure. A second group includes both vertical and horizontal blocks. 
While almost all of the figures carved in prone position are shown wearing a tight cap, their peculiarity is that they also have an oblong pendant. This ornament also appears in some of the figures carved on vertical monoliths. Some figures include headdresses and the oblong pendant. A common attribute with the other groups is the presence of scrolls in the groin area. In addition, three of the four depicted individuals are accompanied by short hieroglyphic captions. The facing direction of prone and vertical figures implies as well their setting towards a central focal point, like a staircase and the entrance to a super superstructure. As to the oblong pendant characteristic of this group, the ornament bears a striking resemblance to a pendant of cat shell that at the eve of the Spanish conquest was a symbol related to notions of sensuality, pleasure, and dance. Some depictions of the cut shell pendant dating to the 9th and 10th centuries AD, like in the pictorial narrative associated with the Lord Temple of the Jaguars in the main ball court at Chichen Itza, seemingly carry connotations related to rattled accompanied rituals, the ball game, and human sacrifice. The third group includes blocks with figures placed in vertical um, position, but shown in varied postures. Two modal sizes of the stones suggests a two-tier arrangement, and the facing directions of the personages implied as well their setting facing towards a focal point like a staircase and an entrance. Unique to this group is that the personages appear wearing helmets with a chin strap and a diversity of configurations at the top. They also wear the buccal mask that typifies renditions of the rain deity. Equally as well, they exhibit scrolls in the groin area and some are accompanied by hieroglyphic captions. The fourth and last group includes monoliths that depict both prone and vertically placed figures. The individuals wear a tight cap in the head but what is unique to them are attributes of old age, including beards, wrinkles in the cheeks, and at times a hunchback. Except for the ear flares, they are devoid of any other personal ornament, and none of the attested examples thus far includes hieroglyphs. Yet many, if not all, of the scrolls in the yet many, if not all, had uh, the scrolls in the groin area. Postures are varied, and at least some of them have closed eyes. The presence of two stones carved on multiple contiguous surfaces and the orientation of the figures strongly suggests that, in contrast to most of the groups previously described, this one decorated the front wall of a superstructure. The facing directions of the personages also evinces that the megaliths were set towards a central focal point, specifically an entrance. What could have been the setting of these four additional groups of carved stones? The analysis of the architectural history of building L made it clear that the earliest structure had a staircase leading from the ground level to the summit of the platform. One can thus surmise that the original platform had superstructures. Given that the southern portion of the structure was eventually demolished, implies that we will never know what was on top of it. But one can hypothesize that the superstructures may have looked like and how they were arranged by following a number of clues. Some insights can be gleaned from known structures that were earlier, coeval, or slightly later than building L sub. Such structures include multi tier platforms abutting or recessed staircases to reach the various levels, and long enclosures at the top tier arranged so as to define small plazas or courtyards. Further insights can be derived from the architectural configuration that characterized the last two construction phases of building L, including the presence of the triad groups. Their arrangement Closing on three sides an open space that was reached after climbing the staircase has also been attested in, South, 
eastern Mesoamerica, the Maya area, where such a configuration is known to constitute a long architectural tradition. On the basis of these comparisons, the structures atop building El Sub may have been long enclosures, probably with thatched roofs, built on top of shallower platforms and arranged so as to form a central courtyard in front of the stairway. The four, narrative pro the, the four groups of carved stones previously discussed could have decorated the hypothesized three top superstructures. When considering the differences between the figures carved on the megaliths embedded in the facade of the basal platform with those that presumably face the superstructures and their supporting platforms, it becomes evident that the, they display a rank age, um, a, a, a rank based on age. Aside from such general age ranking, attributes in the paraphernalia worn by the figures evince a ranking based on acquired status, including, on the one hand, the right to wear the oblong pendant and headdresses, and on the other, the prerogative of sporting chin-strapped helmets and impersonating the rain god by wearing vocal masks. Thus, one can surmise that the carved stones associated with building El Sub exhibited a four-tier ranking system that combined both ascribed and acquired statuses. This included a first, the lowest echelon of young adults wearing tight caps, a second grade of young adults wearing an oblong pendant and or diverse headdresses, a third rank of adults wearing chin-strapped helmets and the buccal mask of the rain god, and a fourth echelon right at the top center comprised of elders. The hierarchy was visually and kinetically reinforced by placing the depiction of the lowest ranking figures mostly in the basal platform of the building, while those in the upper social echelons were architecturally at the top. In light of these, the Baustrophedon sequence of the vertically placed figures in the facade of the platform would have mimicked not only the ascent through the staircase, but the promotion to higher ranks. An important set of carved stones comprised so far by four fragments is most relevant to the present reassessment of the meaning of the carved stones in building El Sub. The monoliths render isolated heads in profile view wearing the tight cap and the open mouth that reveals two teeth like the individuals in the first echelon in the social hierarchy. Yet these heads have scrolls below them. Such syntagmatic relation leaves no doubt that the carvings are iconic representations of decapitated heads. At least three of them are accompanied by hieroglyphic captions, and these share one of the signs. The glyph in question, highlighted in blue, appears to be the iconic rendition of a sprouting seed. Furthermore, the decapitated head of, um, on one of the fragments is shown with a speech crawl issuing from its mouth. I'm referring about this one. As if speaking the statement encoded by the glyphic caption. One can posit two possible interpretations for the meaning of the captions. One, that they render the personal names of the decapitated individuals, or two, that they allude to the expected outcome in terms of agricultural bounty from the sacrificial offering enacted by decapitation. The first alternative would imply that of the four known examples of decapitated heads, three of them refer to the same sacrificed captive because the glyph is the same one. Although the condition of three stones precludes, of these stones preclude from determining their original shape and size, and there is no clue as to their original architectural context, they may have formed part of the narratives associated to building El Sub, a conclusion that is based on the rendition of the heads wearing the tight cap. The only inference that can be made from the presently available evidence is that these stones were placed so as to face towards a central focal architectural feature. 
because you have three of them facing in this direction and one of them facing in the opposite direction. Now, all the inferences made thus far are at odds with the notion that the car figures were intended to be seen from an upper point of view as bodies lying on the ground, like in a crime scene. But as a prelude to an, an alternative interpretation, it is still necessary to address other arguments that have been proposed in support of the idea that all the figures in these stones represent slain captives. The view by some authors that the representational mode in the carved stones denotes sprawling corpses is apparently based in part on the lack of a baseline. If so, one can equally argue that the omission of such a line was actually a graphic recourse to enhance the two-dimensional representation of movement, a visual strategy by no means exclusive to Zapotec pictorial traditions. For example, uh, the human figure painted without, without a ground line on the south jam of building A at Kakashtla, which can hardly be interpreted as a sprawling corpse, is sufficient to demonstrate my point. The characterization of the different postures um, by a number of scholars as rubbery, awkward, distorted, grotesque, or limp is of course based on value judgments. Most, if not all, the postural descriptions that I have derived from the architectural contextualization of the carvings are anatomically feasible for bodies in movement. What deserves further consideration, however, are the seeming instances of anatomical impossibilities, as several of the well-preserved figures depict inversion of the thumb in one hand or the hyperextension of the feet. Replicating the body posture of the personage shown here in the center, while not impossible, requires much flexibility and is not anatomically impossible. Yet, rather than exemplifying a highly realistic or naturalistic almost photographic representational mode, such instances could simply some, could imply something about the carving procedure or be a graphic device to show the human body simultaneously from different points of view. A strategy that by the way would have further enhanced the sense of movement. The convention to render the female body in the painted murals of tomb 105 from Montalban serves to exemplify the first alternative. Um, it seems, for instance, that the painters intended to show the women in these murals as if moving in procession and with their arms crossed over the upper torso, while at the same time depicting them with a blouse. To achieve such an effect, the painters drew the pair of hands over the garment, showing the palmar rather than the dorsal side. This last feature suggests a stenciled technique in their execution. The proposition that nudity in ancient Mesoamerica exclusively signaled humiliation of captives needs to be addressed as well. But first, it may be worth summarizing the degree of nakedness exhibited by the figures from building El Sub. First, the depiction of tattoos or body paint in some of the personages reinforces the view that they were intended to be shown without garments, despite the fact that the carvers never intended to represent obvious anatomical features like the nipples or the navels. On the other hand, the representation of some type of headgear, like the tight caps, the headdresses, the chin-strapped uh, helmets, of sumptuary goods like the uh, ear flares, the beaded collars, the oblong pendants, and of the ritual paraphernalia, like the buccal masks and probably the rattling uh, anklets, characterizes in different combinations the figures from all the groups except that of the elders, although the latter actually wear caps and ear flares. One can surmise from this review that the anatomical representation of the human body in all the groups of carved stones is not fully realistic. Rather, the intent was to select and focused on representational elements 
that were deemed important to the message, including attributes denoting personal and social identities, body postures, and in the case of most of the stones, the scrolls in the genital area. What is the degree of nakedness in the depiction of captives in other parts of Mesoamerica? The illustrated selection makes it evident that the range goes from complete nudity, except for sumptuary goods, to instantiations of prisoners dressed in elaborate paraphernalia. Yet, what is most common of, to these representations is that they are shown bound by ropes. That this latter attribute, rather than nudity, was also the convention to signal the status of being captive in Zapotec pictorial modes is clear from the rightmost example, this one here, of a prisoner dressed as a jaguar and shown with tied arms behind the torso. While we can concede that these figures seemingly associated with building El Sab were meant to be shown devoid of garments, there is not a single example of a personage that appears bound, as do most captives, slain or not, in other Mesoamerican pictorial traditions. Furthermore, within a larger Mesoamerican context, complete nudity is known to characterize representations that are not related to the status of being captive, but to ritual roles like self-sacrifice by bloodletting from the genitals. One may also ask, if the figures from the early pictorial narratives from Montalban were depictions of slain captives, where are the representations of the captors? In antiquity, the rendering of captives or slain enemies worldwide is frequently counterposed with that of the captor, the latter being larger and or occupying the most dominant position in the visual composition or textual inscription. A few non-Mesoamerican comparative examples uh, include the pictorial narrative in the Narmer Palette that depicts a ruler grabbing a captive by the hair, scenes of Ramses II smitting and holding foes by the hair, the Assyrian stela of the vultures depicting a ruler clubbing down a captive trapped with others inside a net, or the Behistun carving in Iran where Darius the Great is shown confronting his captured political enemies while trampling on the slain body of the first one. And in the pictorial narrative in Cerro Sachin in Peru, where captors are shown together with the dismembered captives. None of these contrasts are evident in the carved stones from the early history of Montalban. The scale of the enterprise to erect building El Sub, both in terms of labor and resources, makes it improbable, improbable that those who commissioned such a construction were interested in remaining anonymous, pictorially uh, anonymous, if they claimed the capture of enemies. If the human representations under consideration are not slain corpses, how do we account for the open mouth in all the figures and the close eyes in many, perhaps all of them? While close eyes and open mouth are seemingly a pan-Mesoamerican representational trope to convey the loss of life, the ontological status of being dead is often depicted with traits that denote the opposite, like the decapitated head that I showed before emitting a speech straw. To postulate that the depiction of closed eyes, open mouth in Mesoamerican representational modes denotes exclusively the condition of being dead, does not grant the ancient carvers with the ability to render other states of being, such as dreaming, meditation, ecstatic trance, or the suffering of pain. Scholars who maintained the carved blocks from building El Sub depict slain captives, interpret the scrolls in the groin area as renditions of, quote, blood flowing from various parts of the body, issuing from one or more wounds, or as graphic allusions to genital mutilation. While captives in Mesoamerica were subjected to different kinds of torture prior to their eventual sacrifice, I am unaware in both the pre-Hispanic pictorial and textual legacy or early European accounts of native life of prisoners being emasculated. Furthermore, 
mutilation of body parts in Mesoamerican representational modes is invariably uh, to convey the depicted severed um, elements. An important point that has been left unaccounted by scholars adhering to the slain captive interpretation is the distinction made by the carvers between human figures placed vertically and those in horizontal position, which as evinced by the carved figures on the facade of building El Sub were placed above the vertical uh, figures. Innumerable examples substantiate the argument that the convention to represent ancestral beings all over Mesoamerica from 800 BC all the way through the 16th century was their depiction in prone position and in the upper section of compositions when rendering within broader syntagmatic contexts. Because some of the horizontal blocks from building El Sab were reused to build the steps in later architectural staircases, the prone figures carved on them have become the favorite point of comparison to the representational practice in the southern Maya lowlands of rendering captives on the razors of stairways so that anyone using them would symbolically trample over the prisoners. The depictions of captives on step risers in the Maya lowlands evidently displayed them alive and bound and in prone or reclining position, but the clear signs of their distress and deliberately uncomfortably body positions do not resemble those in the prone, unbound figures from building El Sub. Yet the posture of having an arm frontally extended while the other lies behind or bends over the torso is common in the representation of ancestors. Thus, the symbolic trampling of prisoners is context specific and does not necessarily apply to all state cases. Now, epigraphic data has also been used in support of the slain captive interpretation. A specific sign, first interpreted as far back as 1928 as the iconic rendition of a dart thrower, which occurs at least 12 times in the hieroglyphic captions, um, is assumed to have the semantic value of defeated, taken, or slain in battle. Yet, as shown here, the iconicity of the glyph in question, which is highlighted in red, is that of a rattle rather than a dart thrower. A key point of departure, oh, sorry, a key point of departure for re-evaluating the meaning of the carved stones from building El Sub concerns the semantic value of the scrolls carved in the groined area in most of the figures. I'm going to assume that they stand for blood, implicating as well the performance of self-sacrifice by bloodletting from the genitals, a male ritual practice well attested in ancient Mesoamerica. This assumption can account as well for two of the most common traits in the depicted personages, that is, the lack of garments, so as to spill the blood on the ground or on other media such as bar paper, and the closed eyes, open mouth gesture, a graphic device to convey in part the suffering of pain. The squatting position of some of the figures also reinforces um, this assumption. Bloodletting as a representational theme is admittedly sparse in the known pre-Hispanic pictorial corpus from Oaxaca. As a matter of fact, I'm aware of only two examples that indirectly, um, by means of symbolic substitutions, allude to the practice. Yet, objects used to perform bloodletting, like stingray spines and obsidian perforated, perforators that at times mimic them, have been found in contexts dating as early as 600 BC. And in the early 16th century, a Spanish friar recorded in his Spanish Zapotec dictionary the expression toso quesa tiaga ya, which he translated as to sacrifice oneself, shedding blood from some of the parts of the body with a blade, in the ears, in the tongue, the genitals, and in the thighs. Two accounts in the 1580 census from Oaxaca ordered by Philip II are most revealing. 
For instance, the Relación Geográfica of Tehuantepec states that, in quotes, and the natives drew blood from their own ears, tongues, and private parts, and offered it to the said idols with much incense and with oil derived from um, amber. The Relación Geográfica from Atlatlauca records the following. And once in this priestly office, the occupant rank even higher than the ruling lord, because nothing was done unless he oversaw it or was consulted about it. And once approved by him, it was executed. If he disapproved, it was abandoned. And to see if it was convenient to do it or not, this priest cast an oracle, sort of witchcraft they practiced. Through it, they invoked the demons. These oracles were cast particularly when they went to war or when the ruling lord wanted to engage in warfare. This latter statement allow us to link three of the already established interpretive premises, that the figures are shown in the aftermath of bloodletting their genitals, moving act actively to enhance the spilling of blood, invoking the ancestors as oracular conduits to prognosticate if warfare raids were to be successful, and the outcome of victorious enterprises, that is the capture, the sacrifice, and the decapitation of enemies. The facial expression in the figures would denote then both the suffering of pain from bloodletting and the state of being in ecstatic state while invoking ancestral spirits. If so, the figures carved on the stones render the members of a four-tiered warrior sodality the type head cap worn by individuals from the first, second, and fourth echelons would thus represent a protected device and hence a practical accoutrement of war. The cross-cutting of this type of headgear across the age grade system could indicate that elders are being depicted as honorary warriors, and its rendering in the fourth, in the fourth, in, in the four decapitated heads perhaps implies that captors and captives were from the same ethnic affiliation. The more elaborate types of headgear and subtory um, ornaments signaled higher ranking within the sodality, and these may not have been necessarily used in the battlefield, but worn exclusively in ritual performances. The depiction of warriors as rain deity impersonators implies that within the organization, there was overlap with priestly roles and offices, specifically those perceived with the ability to attract or repel clouds. The same applies to the elders, members at the top of the organization who most likely formed a council entrusted with political, religious, and military decision-making prerogatives. What can be made of the two figures, both from the lowest row of card blocks in the facade of building L sub, who are shown with their folly exposed and erect, particularly in light of other known renditions of bound and naked captives who are depicted in the same state of sexual arousal, that is, erect penises or seemingly ejaculating. Since it is unlikely that captured enemies would be about to, that were to be about uh, to be tortured and sacrificed would be erotically aroused, the latter representations must be symbolic conflations of humans to be offered as part of a sacred covenant and the allusion to the granting by the divine of human procreative powers. On the other hand, given physiological processes, the penis, when erect, becomes a copious reservoir of blood. Thus, sexual arousal, whether mentally or physically induced, was probably a prelude to the enactment of bloodletting. Furthermore, mortification of the sexual organs would have temporarily forced enactors towards sexual abstinence, an offering to repay divine favors for success in warfare that, in addition, would have allowed warriors to concentrate energy for the battlefield. Thus, in light of these premises, it seems evident that according to an ideology elaborated by the elite, um, warfare formed part of a ritual cycle aimed at ensuring community well-being. Consequently, 
Another reason for engaging in raids was to seize enemies alive, to sacrifice them and offer them to reciprocate divine favors, including agricultural fertility, and hence the rain god impersonators, and human fecundity, hence the overt and covert allusions to human sexuality that guaranteed the biological perpetuation of society. The meaning of building El Sab and its associated carved stones was evidently polysemic. It was not only the hub for a key political, religious, and military institution during the early history of Montalban, but can also be construed as both a monument that commemorated the enthronement of three rulers and as a veritable war memorial that honored living and dead warriors. Rain God impersonators and elders, identifying some of them, perhaps the most heroic, by their personal names. In addition, the edifice embodied a ranked form of social organization. Yet, the pictorial narrative probably does not memorialize a single event. Rather, as hinted by the inscriptions on the corner megaliths of the basal facade, it most likely encapsulated recurrent perhaps calendrically prescribed rituals, combining the ideological permanence of sacred pre pre propositions with the ephemeral instantiation of localized historical events. Based on the highly esoteric nature of the ideology underlying their associated ritual practices, it is unlikely that everybody in the community gained access to the top of the building. While the facade of building El Sab may have been seen by larger audiences, access to the top structures was most likely restricted and reserved to the members of the sodality. The four-tier organization evinced by the carved figures as set in their hyp hypothesized architectural arrangement, together with the presumed content of the inscriptions on the cornerstones, point to both exclusionary perhaps three or four sequential rulers, and corporate, a council of elders and religious specialists, forms of government during the early history of Montalban. The possible representation of one of the presumed rulers in a carved block from the third row suggests that the ruling elite concealed their exclusionary interests by situating their initiated members at the bottom of the ranked system and to proclaim promotion like any other eligible person though through community service, including, of course, success in warfare. Ultimately, the elaboration and monopoly by the elites of an ideology that centered on a primordial covenant between humans and the divine and their choice to commission an architectural monument to bolster community well-being instead of the self-aggrandizement of paramount and charismatic leaders suggests that some of the societal uses of early writing in Oaxaca served the purpose of internal power building strategies stemming from potential factionalism of diverse constituencies and the masking of inequalities by promoting group identities, the latter being crucial in the context of intercommunity conflict and new ways of urban living. Thank you. Sorry, I'm trying to unmute myself here. Um, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. That was just fascinating. Um, I am looking down at my question box and I don't see any questions there and I hope I'm not missing some. Um, and if any of the other uh, committee members can look in the question box and see if I'm just not somehow getting them, uh, let me know. Um, but that does give me an opportunity, oops, that does give me an opportunity to ask some of my own questions because I have, I have quite a few here. So um, let me see if I can start with those. Um, I, I was wondering um, if, I, it, it seems like there are structures on top of the building L that would those have been places where like war chiefs uh, operated, um, important people that were involved in warfare and hence the, the, the warrior depictions below it? 
Right. Uh, again, uh, as, as I argued in, in the paper, uh, this would have been the building itself would have been the hub of, for a uh, warrior sodality that was, you know, hierarchically arranged uh, by uh -huh. age. Um, so the assumption is that at the top of the of the building, uh, you would have had all kinds of additional semiotic systems, uh, including warfare, um, divinatory, um, uh, bloodletting paraphernalia. Um, I would even imagine lots of shouting and drum accompanying, uh, accompanied uh, uh, rhythms. Uh, yeah, uh, pretty much like all the, the secret warrior sodalities that have been documented uh, in other parts of the world, like in Melanesia, that have these men's houses full of, uh, you know, the warfare and divinatory paraphernalia. Yeah, okay. That, yeah, that's uh, that, that's a, a good visual sort of give you an idea of, of what was I mean, going on there. Obviously, the, the, the problem is that uh, what needs to be done is to conduct uh, surgical, surgical interventions in building L, which is encasing um, the interior structure um, in order to put all these ideas to the test. So that's the neat thing about this model, that uh, there is ample opportunity uh, for archaeological research to you know, go and test this uh, this model. Yeah, great. Um, this, uh, I'm getting a message from Dimitri that apparently there is a problem with the question. So he, I, I guess some people may break in and ask some. I'll ask another one, and then if someone else wants to jump in, um, go right ahead. Um, I was wondering if um, bloodletting is. Um, is sort of universal to Mesoamerica, or is that something specific there? Yeah, no, I think that this is certainly a pan-Mesoamerican um, um, ritual practice. Um, it has been documented, um, you know, um, probably at least by 800 BC, if not earlier, uh, in the form of objects that were used in order to um, let the blood from different parts of, 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 the, of the body. Um, and as I mentioned uh, in the paper, it was also documented by a number of um, um, uh, Spanish missionaries that were keenly interested in recording uh, ways of life among native peoples. Um, so we, we, we have substantial archaeological evidence all across the board, um, uh, spatially and temporally, to ascertain that it's a, it was a very common practice. Okay, great. Well, I, I do have questions now. I, I must have hit the right button or something, but um, this is um, uh, David Mora Marin. Uh, do specific glyphic passages support some of these ritual practices and associations, such as deity glyphs used to name individuals or glyphs icon, um, iconically suggesting, suggestive of bloodletting associated with depictions of bloodletting? Um, as I said, uh, we don't have that much, it, 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 it looks like, you know, in the latter part of the pre-Hispanic sequence, um, Zapotecs were not keenly interested in representing uh, in a very explicit way the practice of uh, bloodletting. Uh, for, for instance, like uh, we know very well in the Maya region, or for instance, in some parts of the Gulf Coast, uh, where we do have very explicit, very iconically transparent depictions of bloodletting. Um, in, in, in Oaxaca, it seems that there was no interest in, um, certainly after um, the early formative, to represent um, glyphically or um, by means of imagery, um, bloodletting. But again, you know, we have all these uh, archaeological objects like the perforators um, that attest to the, uh, to the practice. Okay, perfect. Um, and Dimitri, uh, if there's a note there that says you'd like to answer the question uh, or, or make a comment. Me? Yeah. No, no, I just meant to say that we panelists can't type questions into the Q&A. So if we want to ask a question, we just have to sort of jump in. But there are questions. Okay. On the &A. That's all I was saying. Okay. Well, let me let me. We've got a, a minute or so for a, this um, this second question here. Uh, this is by William Mex, um, and he says, 
What do you think about the hypothesis of an Olmec Ismanian, Ismanian origin of Mesoamerican writing systems and the question of diffusion slash influence? That's something worked. Uh, that's something worked for Alfonso La Candana, Engelhardt, among others. Right. Um, well, I think the, this takes us back to the um, um, issue that um, William. Um, uh, addressed in uh, in the first talk, um, uh, you have one camp um, that you know posits that all Mesoamerican uh, scripts must develop from a, you know a single primordial idea, and you have another camp that um, argues that you know the possibility of uh, polygenesis even within a very um, you know um, singular geographical area. Um, when, when Professor Baltz was talking about the case of Egyptian and Mesopotamian scripts, um, um, you know, again, the, the idea that there has to be a single idea that uh, eventually diffuses elsewhere um, is very prominent. Uh, one can, uh, for instance, consider the possibility, why not, uh, in, just like in Mesoamerica as well, of, you know, developments that are coterminous. Um, I mean, in the history of ideas, we know that, you know, sometimes people that don't even know themselves, you know, each other may come up with the same idea. I mean, a beautiful example is the idea of natural selection by Alfred Wallace and Charles Darwin. Um, they didn't know about each other and they were, you know, thinking about uh, nature um, while working in two different parts of the world. And they, they came, came up with a very similar idea. Um, so, you know, I think that in Mesoamerica, one can open the possibility of polygenesis. Um, now, regarding an Olmec script, the only thing that we have thus far, you know, it makes reference to the, um, 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 the block from Cascajal, but, you know, I guess it's uh, like um, in the case of uh, what the, the, the work that Dimitri does in, in Aegean scripts, um, it's very much like the case of the Faistos disc. It's like, a, you know, an outlier, a single example. So I would rather wait until we have more evidence that dates earlier to the material that I outlined for Oaxaca in my presentation to um, address that question. Uh, but at least I hope I'm, I'm, I'm open to both possibilities, either a single, um, you know, primordial script uh, or the possibility of uh, multiple ideas um, pretty much unfolding in the same context of interregional interaction. Um, but, you know, uh, in Mesoamerica, of course, we have a tremendous linguistic fragmentation in a very small, um, geographical region. Um, and just to give you an example, in Oaxaca, the, the work that linguists have done um, illustrates uh, a, an incredible amount of linguistic variability that is aching to the Indo-European languages. And this is only in southwestern Mesoamerica. So uh, it's a very small geographical space and yet a tremendous amount of uh, um, linguistic variability. So all these different, uh, you know, uh, early uh, scripts from, Mos from uh, Mesoamerica, including, uh, you know, the Isthmian script, the Maya script, uh, the Zapotec script, these are scripts that are, you know, uh, aiming at coding very specific languages. Um, and, you know, they, yes, they share a lot of similarities. All of the uh, signs are uh, highly iconic. Um, you know, they, they have linear sequences. Um, some of them may have more canonical reading orders. Uh, the case of the Zapotec, as I attempted to illustrate in the case of the texts that I had placed in the reconstruction uh, in the corner stones uh, of the building, uh, clearly illustrates, you know, the variability in reading orders. You can go top to bottom, uh, left to right, or um, vice versa. Um, you can also go bottom to top. Um, so very, very varied uh, reading orders. Uh, but I think it has mostly to do with other semiotic systems. Uh, perhaps uh, I want to emphasize that I wanted, what I wanted to, you know, um, sort of tackle uh, in my presentation is that 
in sharp contrast to other uh, scripts like Maya, uh, or, you know, in, in, we can also consider, um, you know, uh, cuneiform uh, or um, Egyptian, uh, there is no um, uh, code or, or key um, for the decipherment of, of the Zapotec script. So you may have noticed that my, my aim was to search for alternative viable methods. And the overriding method that I'm pursuing here is the contextual method. In other words, trying to put together what is already quite a puzzle, given the fact of all the taphonomic processes of use and reuse, um, dismantling, um, you know, demolishing of structures, reusing parts of uh, them here and there. Um, so the idea is to try to uh, at least uh, recreate how the audiences may have uh, visually perceived uh, the original context of, of the inscriptions. Um, so it's, it's a highly contextual method. Um, and, and very interesting one too. Well, but, but here the, the, the argument is that if one adds layers of signification, then potentially one can narrow down possibilities. Um, and that's why, for instance, the architectural arrangement is telling us something about the inscriptions. Um, if we just zoom in uh, onto the inscriptions, then we are missing uh, the larger uh, semiotic uh, layers, um, the, the semiotic sedimentation um, that, you know, uh, is inevitable in the, the, the social usage practices of, of, of writing. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, well, I think that was all our questions uh, for um, Professor Sid.